So, uh, <clears throat> when we think of Hanukkah, there's lots of different areas that that, that people uh, don't don't. Uh, what should I say? They, they, I suppose to a certain degree, we lose we lose the uh, the story, the history, of what happened. So I'll give a little bit of a history, and uh, if anything is overly basic or too detailed, let me know. I want to start with some history and how we got into the whole story of Hanukkah. The story of Hanukkah started, so we know about Alexander the Great, right? Alexander the Great, when he comes, he comes to Jerusalem. We spoke about this a while ago, that when Alexander the Great went and he was conquering the world, the, that whole Middle East, uh, when he came to, to, to Jerusalem, he um, every place that he went, he Hellenized them. He taught them the Greek ways, the ways of uh, the Greek philosophers and things like that. When he came to Jerusalem, um, something different happened. The great Shimon HaTzadik, who was the great uh, high priest at the time, this is in the Second Temple era, did something against Torah law, which is he walked out of the temple with his with all the priestly garments. Now, Torah law says that a high priest is not, not allowed to do that. And when he did that, he went out of the temple and he went into the streets of Jerusalem and he went out in the garments of the high priest to welcome Alexandra. And Alexandra did something that he'd never done before. In front of all his generals and all his soldiers, he, Alexandra got off his own chariot or his own horse and he went and he bowed down to Shimon Atzadik who was the high priest and the leader of the Jewish people at the time and his soldiers were totally you know taken aback they've never seen their king bowing down to somebody else and they asked him why is he doing this and he said because in front of my <clears throat> when whenever I go to war I had a vision of a person and I had the vision of this individual so now I believe that there's something about this individual. Okay, whether Alexander the Great was a good person or not, he certainly was a very powerful person. We know that he died at a young age, and he divides his his um, his massive kingdom into uh, into more or less two parts. The one is the Greek side and the Syrian side. Now the Syrian side falls under the rulership of. Uh, Ju um, Israel falls in the, 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 the rulership of the Syrian side. But one thing that Alexandra had done is he said he wasn't going to impose Hellenist um, Greek law on Israel. And as a gift of thanks for, for that, Shimon Atzadik decreed that all Jewish males born in Jerusalem that year should name after Alexandra. And that's the way Alexandra became a Jewish name. It's a famous Jewish name today that we give our, that, 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 that many people have given their children. Because that year in Jerusalem, <coughs> sorry, many Jews received that name. Now, going forward, after, this, after Alexander's death and the split, most of the first rulers of the Syrian Greek empire remained quite friendly to the Jewish people until the individual by the name of Antiochus came along and he kind of forgot about Alexandra's kindness and the rules that it put in place to keep the Jewish people, allowing them to keep their own laws. And he decided that, you know, why should the Jewish people be any different to anybody else? Every other place that we've conquered, we've taught them Greek rules, we've taught them the laws and the ways of uh, the, the Greek society, we've Hellenized Syria and many other countries, let's do it to the Jews as well. And they started slowly but surely started to set up Colosseums, um, you know, the city of, of Caesarea. Some people believe that it's connected to the Romans, but some even think it, back to the, uh, it, it dates back to, to uh, the Greeks. It seems more likely that it's from Herod, which was later. But anyway, they set up Colosseums and they started doing, uh, not necessarily Colosseums, but they started doing their games <laughs> all around the, um, 
or the, the temple. And as a result, many Jews started connecting themselves with Hellenistic teachings. And then they started imposing their laws more and more. And eventually they came to a point where they said, um, the, the, it came, the worst point it came to was when they made a new rule that every woman before they got married, every young girl before she got married, the night of the wedding, they had to first lose their virginity to a Greek soldier, to a Greek uh, general or whatever it was. It was a particular general. Um, and this law was imposed together with a bunch of other laws, laws that forbade people to circumcise and to study Torah um, and a few other major principles with which they considered to be the backbone of Judaism, which they were. So there's several stories that we know of that actually initiated the whole um, rebellion against the Greeks. So what's important to note is that the Greeks ruled over the land of Israel for quite some time. And at no time did they rebel against them until they started to mix into the way they lived their life. Time started to outlaw um, Jewish practice and this, this whole issue with the, with the, the brides, etc. At that point, the, there was, a, there was a, a girl by the name of Yehudit who was destined to get married. Some believe that she was actually the daughter of the high priest at the time who was Matisel. So we have almost like two episodes that start off the Jewish rebellion. And both of them, well, one we know was definitely connected to Matisel, uh, who was the high priest and you know, the famous Maccabees. The second one, we believe it, as in there's a, the story, the late that it happens with, is believed to have been the daughter of Mighty Sol, but she could have been another, a daughter of another priest. And uh, on the night of her wedding, on the day of her wedding, she was walking through the marketplace or she was at her wedding. And in the middle of the wedding, she started removing her clothes in front of the people in public. And her brothers and her father, everybody was shocked. And started, you know, quickly covering up and, and stopping her. Thought she'd lost the plot. Now, normally when someone starts getting undressed, you would think that they've lost the plot in public. And she said, yes, it's, a, it's, it's not a good thing for someone to get undressed in public. But you've been so quick to respond when I started to just get undressed in public, but what this Roman, what this Greek soldier or general is going to do to me tonight in private that you haven't um, you haven't made a big fuss about. And as a result, the, uh, that was like the first starting point where the Jewish people said, okay, we have to do something about it. We have to start taking things into our own hands. So there's a famous concept that we say that the Jewish woman, um, there's a concept that we know that the menorah lighting is generally done by the man, the men in the house. Nevertheless, we're told that women shouldn't be doing the work, shouldn't be working, they shouldn't do labor, they shouldn't work, they should take a break for the first half an hour while the, while the candles are burning. And the Talmud says, why? You would think that it's a, a male celebration, so to speak. The men lit the, the menorah in, in the temple. The men went to war and had the victorious war. So obviously we know that that's just over simplification. But the truth is that the major episodes that started the whole rebellion actually started by women. There's a second woman um, that also did something which was connected to the Hanukkah story that was more militarily involved. And her name, um, sorry, her name is Yehudit. The, the other story 
of the woman that got undressed in public, she, I, I can't, I don't know if her name was Yehudit, but this lady, was second, second lady, definitely was Yehudit. Um, and the story of Yehudit is that she was a Jewish girl, a Jewish woman that was supposed to be very beautiful, but she, um, she managed to somehow manipulate the, the Greek army and convince them that she was on their side. And she somehow managed to hang around the base. She was the only Jewish woman that got in there. And she managed to hang around there. And she managed to convince and started to become friends with them. And she befriended the general of the army. And after building a relationship, we have more details, but the, 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 the short story is she builds a relationship with the general and eventually the general feels like he's got her and he's going to be able to, to sleep with her. And she uh, eventually, he's, she's built up enough trust to be alone with the general. And when she's alone with him, she gives him a very strong wine. And that knocks him out, makes him all tipsy and knocks him out. And once, uh, once that happens, she takes his sword and she, um, she killed him and she took him, uh, she, she, she escaped. Sorry, Fritz, I, I just realized I shouldn't have said that, getting into the gore details. But anyway, she, she actually escaped with his head outside of the camp and told them and told the gods he doesn't want to be disturbed. And she managed to be escape to, to escape all the way back to Jewish quarter and give the head. And then uh, there was a great retreat from the, the that 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 put, made made a major panic on the Greek side. So these two episodes we're told um, are <clears throat> were so significant in the ultimate victory that came about from the Jewish woman that we ultimately say that yes, the actual wars and the actual main events were done by men. But behind the scenes, the, the people that were the big players were the women. And that's always been the story in every single episode in Jewish life. We know when it comes to Purim, the story of Purim is ultimately done by Esther. Um, when it comes to, when it comes to uh, Pesach, the story of the Exodus, it's done by Miriam to a certain degree. She's the one that saves Moshe and makes Moshe even, <coughs> sorry, become alive. So there's one third incident, which is less directly connected to women, but I just think it's important to say, this is the, the, the incident that takes it from being a theoretical rebellion to an actual rebellion. And that's the, the famous story where the Greeks set up an idol in the center of Modi'in. Modi'in is the neighboring city to Jerusalem. By the way, um, for any of you that have been following the in news, you would be aware that there was a, a terrorist attack a few days ago in Israel. And there was one, um, one person that was killed. That person that was killed his, uh, his name is Eddie Kay. I actually knew him. His, mo his mother was my teacher in school. Uh, so I knew his family well, uh, part of the Chabad community from South Africa. Um, anyway, his parents recently, just a few months ago, moved to Israel and they, um, they live in Modi Inn, which is an interesting connection. Just reminded me of that. Well, I should dedicate this year to, to Eli, Elia David Ben Avi. And Devora. All right, that's just a side point. But anyway, in the city of Modi'in, which was the place where the high priests lived, lived uh, at least the family of Matisyahu, there was a very big uh, Jewish population over there. And the Greeks set up an idol in the center of town. And they called all the Jews together and they said, we want you to buy down to this Greek god idol. Right? Everyone knows about the Greek gods. And one Hellenist Jew, who we know that his English name was Jason, he had taken upon himself a Greek name. He said, I'll do it. 
And as he's about to do it, Matisyahu, who was the high priest, runs up and shoves a sword into him and kills him in front of the Greek soldiers. And then he makes an announcement. Uh, first of all, we do know, or at least it's recorded in our, in our history, that when he did that, this young boy, Jason, asked him for forgiveness and asked him to daven for him. And he said Shema and asked for forgiveness for what he had done by publicly desecrating the name of Hashem. We know that the rule is that there's, for all things, we should rather, rather to desecrate a mitzvah than, than give up our lives, except for what are the three cardinal sins. The three cardinal sins is idolatry, adultery or promiscuity and murder. So if you see somebody that is doing one of those acts in public, you actually have an obligation. If you see somebody doing that act, if somebody comes up to somebody and says, I want you to, <clears throat> want you to uh, kill this person. So you're not allowed to do it, right? Rather be killed. If somebody says, I want you to buy down to this idol. But if you actually see somebody that is about to bow down to an idol publicly, you actually have an obligation to kill them before they do it. Why? Because it's considered the greatest desecration of our shows. Now, how this law would play out in today's day and age, and we don't have the death penalty is a discussion for another time. But Matisso does this. And when he does that, he, um, he obviously is, is uh, publicly rebelling against the, Greek, the, Greek, the Greeks for the first time in the most public way. He, he gathers his sons and he makes a sign and he stands up and he says, Me la shem elai, who, um, whoever is for God, for the Jewish God, the belief of the Jewish people come to me. And in the hills of what in he starts the great rebellion, and that's how we have eventually the Hanukkah story. He gets he gathers a few thousand Jewish people that are willing to fight for the cause of Judaism. And I, and I, and I want to say that we're fighting for the cause of Judaism, not for the, the 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 cause of autonomy. The rabbis, for some reason, and discussion also for another time, never necessarily fought for autonomy. In other words, we never, because later on in history, a couple hundred years later, at the end of the uh, end of the Second Temple era, when Jewish people decide that they have to go and rebel against the Romans, because after the story of, of Hanukkah, the Jewish people regain autonomy over the land of Israel. And then later on, the Romans take over. And they still allow the Jewish, Jewish people to practice Judaism. But if you've ever been to Masada or places like that, you'll know that there was a massive rebellion from the Jewish people. But it was not it was a very divided Jewish people, the Jewish people and, and, and the rabbis in particular did not necessarily back that rebellion because they had not taken away any of our right to Judaism and we had never fought willing to sacrifice our lives for that reason, especially if we had um, naturally no chance of winning. So they used the Hanukkah story at that point, at the end of the Second Temple era, to show, hey, look, God will be with us and we'll be victorious. So the Hanukkah story was the exception because they were fighting against actual Jewish practice. A small amount of soldiers were miraculously able to defeat a much, much bigger army, something which is absolutely unnatural. Okay, so that's the um, that's the, the the main points about the Hanukkah story that I wanted to mention. Does anybody have any questions before I go into a, just a little bit of a, a deeper concept? Any other any questions or points? No. Okay, we don't have Joe to uh, find questions for us. Um, <laughs> so that's this this is the story of Hanukkah. We know that the story of Hanukkah is the ultimate miracle of Hanukkah is not just the victory, but ultimately it's the candles, the story of the candles, where yes, there's this incredible victory and we get back autonomy over the land of Israel, but then they come to the temple. The temple had been taken over and ransacked by the Greeks and they put idols everywhere. The service in the temple had to be stopped. 
and they clean it out. And the first thing they want to do, or once they've cleaned it out, they want to light the menorah. And specifically the candle, the menorah episode where they find the one jar of oil and that lasts for eight days, that ends up being the significance of, 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 the, of Hanukkah. Now, interestingly enough, um, to a certain degree, the Chabad, the Chabad symbol, for some reason, has become the menorah. And it's not just Chabad. Many organizations have, you know, in Knesset in Israel, they also have a menorah. Um, it's almost the, the Knesset sign in Israel. It's become a sign of Judaism. But why? What's so important about the menorah? Why, do we, why does it have such significance? It kind of almost like represents Judaism. To a certain degree, the menorah, we can understand why it represents the Jewish people more than even the Magen, the Magen uh, David. <laughs> Many people don't even understand what the Magen David is. We don't even know the exact, there's different interpretations of why we have a Magen David. But the menorah, everyone knows of its significance. It's so important to Jewish practice, the fact that we light it for eight days, the fact that it's a symbol for everything. What's the symbol of the menorah? The, the, the menorah is ultimately the symbol of almost everything that Judaism stands for. We light the menorah, over here in Australia, we light the menorah at summer. So unless you stay up a bit later, it gets dark quite late. But in the rest of the world, in the, in the Northern hemisphere where most Jews live, it's winter and it gets dark relatively early. So when you're lighting the candles, most chances are it's going to be already dark. And that's when you're supposed to, by the way, if you do light your candles early, we're supposed to try to make sure that it lasts for half an hour after, after nightfall. Which this year is a lot easier than other years because actually Hanukkah is relatively early this year. So it's not even that late. It just has to go from about 10 past nine to about 9.40 compared to other years where you only like the, it has to go from 9.30 to 10. But ideally it goes for half an hour after nightfall. Why? Because the whole purpose of the menorah is to illuminate the darkness. And the point of that is to say, Judaism is all about, yes, there's going to be really difficult times in Jewish history. We're going to struggle through the most difficult and hardest of times more persecution than any other people, but every single episode that happens to Jewish people, while never to be justified, it always had an ultimately, we always came out stronger. We always came out far more powerful. Never did the Jewish people come out as a weaker, a weaker as a whole after something that happened to them. So let me explain to you what I mean. There was an interesting, uh, an interesting uh, thing that happened a few weeks ago in the Torah. We find this concept where Avram sends, if anybody has to go, I see it's already one o'clock, so I've already gone over time. But there's this episode of, of Avram sends his servant Eliezer to find a wife for his, for his, uh, for his son Yitzchak. And the commentaries tell us that Eliezer really wanted to, to marry him and marry his daughter off to Abraham. And there's a very controversial Rashi over there that says that Abraham told Eliezer, sorry, mate, I, my son can't marry your daughter. You know why? Because you are cursed and I am blessed. You're my servant. What does that mean? That's like, are we now redefining Abraham as being the, the original racist? Was Avram the first racist? Is this where it all started from? And the Rebbe has an incredible uh, explanation, which is very much related to this week's parasha as well. I'd like to tie it in. <clears throat> and the Rebbe says, what was, what was Avram talking about? You curse and I'm blessed. Where's the curse? Where's the blessing? Eliezer was a descendant of Ham. Noah had three children. Ham, Shem, Ham, and Yafes. Ham was the son that did terrible things to Noah, and Noah ultimately curses him that his children will be servants, will be slaves, sorry. And the older son, Shane, was the holy one. He got all types of blessings. That's the blessing. That's the curse and the blessing that he's talking about. Rebbe said, so what's the problem? Let him, let him marry someone from Ham. Maybe he'll be able to help him. 
He said, no, there's a, a fundamental problem. When, what, what does it mean to be a slave? What it means to be a slave is that you're enslaved by conditions that you believe that are beyond you. You believe that there's circumstances and things that are going on that are beyond who you are. There are things that you can't get out of, that you're a victim of things that have happened to you. You are not in control of your desires or you're being persecuted by anti-Semitism or Nazis or Palestinians or you're in some type of circumstances and you have your own drives and you can't go beyond that. This is the circumstance. This is the life that I've been up to and I'm stuck. That's the definition of a, serv of a slave. A slave is somebody that doesn't have the free choice to decide what to do. It doesn't, to be a slave doesn't mean that you're actually owed by an owner, that you have a taskmaster over you and telling you what to do. To be a slave means that you're not free to be who you really want to be. Now, if you look at history, just most recent history, the last hundred years of history, look at example, the Jewish people coming out of the Holocaust. What happened to Jewish people? After the Holocaust, the worst atrocity ever to happen in history, as far as we know, more persecution and suffering and torture that people have ever persecuted. And, to, and today, 75 years later, the Jewish people have come out stronger and have had a greater influence on the world than they've ever had. Not for a moment did they remain stuck. They were refugees for a short amount of time and they immediately found their ways and rebuilt their lives. Not only just rebuilt their lives, they transformed the world. Israel became this, the most powerful small country in a short amount of time. We gave the world everything from spirituality to technology, to medicine, to military. We gave the world everything. And when did that all happen? To a certain degree, all after the Holocaust. Look at other people that have still been refugees for the last 75 years, or certain people that have been slave mentality for hundreds of years, and they still consider themselves children of slaves. In this week's portion, we talk about Yosef going, becoming the slave, being sold by his, um, by his brothers. It all starts off with, the, with Yosef being sold as his, by his brothers to be a slave, and then he gets put in prison. And in every situation, he manages to come out and not be limited by his circumstances. He goes free and beyond. And he's able to use that darkness of slavery to go free and to become great. And there's so much more I could say about this, but we're already over time. I just want to say, this is the story of Tanaka. You have a man like Yosef that is, has every reason to be upset. His brothers sold him as slavery. Then he's falsely accused by his master's wife of raping her, thrown into prison. In his master's house, he becomes a leader. In prison, he becomes a leader. And he ultimately becomes a, becomes a viceroy of Egypt. Eventually, the next stage is the Jewish people get enslaved, and they come out and they become the Jewish people. At no point in history has the Jewish people ever been um, have we ever been limited or brought down by darkness, by the darkness of the Greeks, the darkness of the Egyptians, of the Holocaust, of any system had never made, managed to break us down. And the menorah is ultimately the vehicle that we express this concept to show that within every single dark situation, there's really a light that is hidden over there. And while we pray to God that we should never have these dark situations, but we know that when they do, God forbid, happen, there's something really powerful about to be born. So we've gone through a little bit of a difficult situation the last 18 months, or perhaps a little bit more than a little bit of a difficult situation. Thank God, I, we're certainly not comparing that to any other times, but for our lives, it hasn't been easy. But we know that something great is going to happen. We're going to come out of this to believe that we're going to come out of this in any way weaker or less than we went into this is not the Jewish way. We always come out stronger and darkness always brings out the great light of the menorah. So that's my thoughts for you today, my friends. May we be blessed that this year, this Hanukkah, we should be able to see it in the most revealed way possible. Happy Hanukkah.
and uh, Shabbat Shalom. Good to see you. If anybody has any questions or comments, feel free. Thanks, Rabbi. All good. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, and it, once again, Sam uh, sponsored our, our, our Hanukkah event on Sunday in memory of his son. We'd love if anybody is, is able to come, wants to come with family or friends. It's going to be a beautiful event, Kingswood Golf Course. I uh, would love to see you there. Sure, Sam, good man. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Okay, have a wonderful, a wonderful weekend and uh, happy Hanukkah, everybody. We'll see what happens next week if we have our Han uh, Shir in honor of Hanukkah. Um, but I'll be in touch with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.